All right, good evening and welcome everybody to this virtual Zoom event, another edition of Evenings with an Author at the American Library in Paris with guest Alex Beam, author of Broken Glass, Mies van der Rohe, Edith Farnsworth, and the fight over a modernist masterpiece. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library. Just to tell you a bit about us, we are an independent nonprofit institution. We're the largest English language lending library on the continent, and we're also 100 years old this year. So we've been celebrating our centennial sort of creatively as we were confined for a few months and we're still hosting our programs virtually. Um, it's been somewhat of a challenging year, but we've also seen a lot of support coming from our community, from our volunteers, from our donors. So we're very grateful for that and very grateful for you all to be here and to be continuing to join us even as we've had to move virtually for a bit. Um, I should say we've been reopening cautiously as well. So for those of you who are members of the library and who are local, you're welcome to come back and to browse and to borrow books again. I know that many of you will disappear on vacation in the coming weeks. So I invite you to come back and pick up some books for, for the month of August if you'd like to. All right, so this evening we're delighted to be joined by Alex Beam. Uh, he's been a columnist for the Boston Globe since 1987. He previously served as the Moscow Bureau Chief for Business Week. He's the author of several other works of nonfiction in addition to the book we'll be speaking about tonight, including American Crucifixion, The Feud, Gracefully Insane, and A Great Idea at the Time. The latter two were New York Times notable books. He has also written for The Atlantic, Slate, and Forbes FYI. All right, well, it's lovely to have you in the room, Alex. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the American Library for being my host. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I thought we'd start off just a little informally by asking you, you know, given the circumstances, it would be silly not to kind of acknowledge our situation here. So how are you? Where are you? And how has the confinement lifestyle been for you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for asking. I'm sure that question is terribly relevant to every man and woman who's who's in here with us in the chat. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Newton, Massachusetts uh, right now. Uh, my home, the, the disarray of my study is behind me. I, I mean, I'm, a, you know, I'm okay, right? I don't, I don't, <laughs> we don't want to draw this out into some psychological investigation of my relative okayness. I, I, I just hope everyone else is okay, you know? I mean, these, these are not, I, I have many, many privileges in the sense that I have no small children. I, I have, you know, grown, grown children. Um, I, I live comfortably, but I'm, I'm only okay. So I can only imagine the relative unokayness of others. Right. Well, thank you for your, your honest answer. I think that, you know, one way to deal with that is to continue to read and to get together and discuss other worlds. So we're going to take everybody on a journey tonight to Illinois and many other places, I hope. <laughs> um, so for those of us who haven't yet read the book, book Broken Glass, I was hoping, hoping that you could give us kind of the elevator pitch. Um, so tell us what the book is about, whom do we meet, what is at stake in the book, and I would be glad to share some images as well. I've got some of those handy while you answer. Should I go ahead and oh, throw an image up? Great. I'm hoping, yeah, hoping we can find this wonderful color image. Um, yes, um, that's the Farnsworth house in Plano, Illinois. And, and now I will embark on the elevator pitch. <laughs> Although, of course, I never pitched this book idea in an elevator. I, I pitched it in a long, tedious proposal. But um. In any event, I sort of wanted to write a book about an architectural masterpiece. And I'm, I'm positing that this, this, this building that you're looking at is a masterpiece. It's not necessarily a masterpiece for everyone, but for me, it is in fact uh, an architectural masterpiece. It's uh, probably um, Mies van der Rohe's uh, only uh, residential masterpiece. And I wanted to write a book that had a, a rich story, specifically a very rich paper trail that linked the architect to the work, to the building, and also linked the client to the building and to the architect. Um, I had done some uh, architectural writing as a kind of junior varsity uh, competitor. And uh, a friend who edited an architecture magazine suggested the Farnsworth House, uh, certainly because she knew 
the the kind of the rich, the very fertile backstory that 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 is in now. We've been on this elevator a long time, I realize, but bear with me. Um, there's just a very fertile story behind this house, which is simply that uh, Mies and Edith Farnsworth were kind of going out. They were lovers. They had a relationship. They had an intellectual relationship. They had a love relationship. And then they, they had this terribly bitter sort of divorce slash breakup, which created the, the writer's dream. And it's sad that writers feast uh, so lavishly on the sadness of others. But there's this uh, horrible sort of vitriolic lawsuit uh, between the two of them filed by Mies. But in any case, so there is the, the wished for paper trail for me. There's 4,000 pages of uh, legal documents relating to the origins of the relationship of Mies and Edith, relating to the construction of the house, relating to everything. So that's that's the 44th floor elevator pitch of what my book is about. Well, it was an enjoyable elevator ride. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I thought we might want to bring in some more visuals actually right away so that as we, you know, continue to speak about the house, about the book, people will have a sense in their mind of, of the object or the architecture that we're actually discussing. Um, so I'll throw up some images here and you can walk us through them, maybe set the scene, talk about what makes the house so special, so innovative in terms of its, uh, it, what, what is its place in modernism, basically and also what makes it problematic. So we can enter into the question of the, the physical setting of the house as well. And let me just sure. find those images. Um, Here we go. <laughs> okay, we, we can certainly start here because this is, um, this is a picture that was um, taken uh, after the, recently in the 1950s. And the reason I can tell is because this red maple is in the foreground. And I, I, um, I'll go into a little, a little more detail than people might possibly want. But from where we are sitting is the Fox River. This, this house is built 75 feet from a river in Illinois, one hour outside of Chicago. The Mies loved the maple. The maple provided some, va some valuable shade. This is obviously taken towards the end of autumn, shall we say. Here's a second uh, uh, picture uh, with the maple. I'll try to verbalize what's, what's distinctive about the house. Um, it's obviously very, very spare, as you can see. Um, it, it's, it's, it has eight, what I'm calling columns, so they're not formally called, you know, it's supported by eight uh, steel girders that have been uh, brushed clean and then painted white. The the front stairway is is unusual. It's almost Greek in nature. It's this house is often likened to a temple, for obvious reasons. It's um, I keep I mean Mies, uh f for better or worse. Uh, you know, if you were to Google him, you'd come up with this phrase, "Less is more." This is a very dist. I would argue certainly a very distilled almost platonic idea uh, of what a house is and you know how he came to create this and how it worked for the client is in a sense a uh, quite a lively story absolutely and i'll just kind of scroll through a couple more of these so that oh, thank you another oh, uh, yeah this, aha. this might be a, I mean, a good place yeah i should briefly dilate here i mean uh sure. On our left is um, the young Gish, Mies van der Rohe. I mean, not necessarily known to, to everyone here. Um, probably one of the three, four greatest architects of the 20th century with Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, and Walter Gropius. In this picture, uh, Mies is in Germany. He was the final director of the famous Bauhaus. He left Germany in 37 under very complicated circumstances, which I'm happy to discuss if necessary. Um, he, he did not formally flee Nazism. That is not exactly what happened. Um, but he did leave Germany uh, coincidentally with the rise of Nazism and came to Chicago, Illinois, where he had been drafted, as it were, to take over um, what's now called IIT, 
the architecture department of the Illinois Institute of Chicago. Virtu let's, you know, for the purposes of this talk, shortly after arriving in Illinois, he meets the woman on the right. He meets Dr. Edith Farnsworth. Um, she's uh, around 45 years old. He's in his 50s. Um, they hit it off. She's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say anything uh, derogatory in a way. She's, um, she's from a good family in, in Chicago. Um, she's had a fascinating life even up until her early 40s. She went to Italy to become a violin virtuoso, probably narrowly missed out on being a violin virtuoso, dropped back into medical school. Um, in her 20s, was one of only four graduates of Northwestern University's medical school. By the time Mies meets her, interestingly, she's a very rare, successful uh, female medical practitioner. And now we're getting into a, a tiny level of detail. She's also a, a researcher in a field that's only opening up at the time, uh, the field that will later be called nephrology. Um, it's research into kidney diseases. And she's actually some, she's in the avant-garde of this field. Um, a man with whom, uh, from Chicago, with whom she is a, who is a colleague, although not a close colleague, will, will get a Nobel Prize for um, research into Bright's disease. So she's a very, very accomplished woman. She's uh, single, she's never been married. And in any case, sort of my, the, one of the stories in my book is the story of Mies and Edith uh, coming together. Yeah, great. Thank you for walking us through that in a little bit more detail. Um, I did want to ask about, since we've already gotten such a, a nice preview of all of the elements that are in the book, um, I wanted to ask what were your own point of entry was. So if you could tell us a little bit more about the genesis of this book and the idea behind it. Um, and then my, my second question, which is another version of the same question, is a bit of a trick question. Is it a book about a building, the people who constructed it, or their relationship? Right. Um, I feel blindsided by your trick question, Kat. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've kind of briefly stated the genesis of the book, which is I really wanted to write a certain kind of book about architecture that I felt simply didn't exist, a book about an architectural masterpiece that could be narrated by both the architect and the client. I mean, if you want me to skip to the, uh, there actually is one other book, possibly two, like it. There's a book called Falling Water Rising, a little bit like this, where um, it's it's about the creation of falling water, and it's about the relationship between Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Kaufman, his client, for that fit. So this is actually the book I, I wanted to write. Now, the trick question, <laughs> the trick question, um, it's about all three. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm loath, uh, I'm as self-promotional as any other author, but I mean, I also, it's, it is inherently loathsome, but it, it's a successful book about, uh, there are three protagonists. Um, you know, there's the fascinating man, there's the accomplished woman, but the house, the house stands at the middle as I'm, Catherine was forced to read the book for, for work. Very so, much I mean, enjoyed house, it, by the way. <laughs> the house, um, the house abides uh, throughout the book. The house is a character, the house has an afterlife, you know, um, uh, long after uh, both uh, Mies and Edith ha have have left the scene, so to speak, the, the house is is there right right now. You know, it was flooded as recently as six weeks ago. So, mm -hmm. to answer your questions about all three. Okay, great. And we will return to um, yeah to this idea that the the house itself is kind of a main character. But for now, I did want to get into kind of the drama of the book here. So let's talk about the trial for a moment. Um, what was the dispute that landed everybody in the courtroom? Um, was there a great deal of contemporary inter interest in the trial? Was there gossip? And then if you could just walk us through how things were settled or remain unsettled at the end. Right. So the Farnsworth House, as it's known, um, named after the client, Dr. Edith Farnsworth, was the subject of one of uh, probably the, the most significant piece of architectural litigation ever. And the, the, the suit, which uh, eventually you know, dragged on and on for many, many years, started um, basically because uh, Mies and Edith were at loggerheads. Um, the, 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 the price that of the house just kept rising. When she met him at a dinner party, she thought he, that she was going to have a villa made by one of the greatest architects of the 20th century for about $40,000. She, 
She was a woman of means, but the, the, the price just kept skyrocketing, well over $70,000. Uh, these are big numbers, um, you know, uh, in, in 1950. And what happened was after they had sort of an emotional parting of the ways, she said, I'm not gonna pay you any more money. Mises people eventually calculated that this, this um, house cost about $87,000. And then in a complicated uh, series of events that are, that are, that are explained in the book, uh, Mises urged to sue her for the outstanding balance of $17,000. Um, and this is, a, this is just a catastrophe. Um, Unbelievably, uh, I had earlier mentioned that she's um, sort of in the leading edge of researchers in the field of nephritis. She had uh, saved the life of a very talented litigator who, to whom she mentioned her problems in a hospital conversation of all things. And he said, well, if you're having legal problems, I'd be happy to represent you. You saved my life. So again, catastrophically, Mies has a very top level white shoe law firm uh, representing him, a law firm that's still quite active in Chicago. But she has a, a rather skilled litigator who's working for free. And, and so she has no money concerns in any event. Yes, there's plenty of gossip um, in the trial record. Uh, the lawyers make fun of Mises' inability to speak English, which is very real. He basically can't speak English. They make fun of his ability, of his inability, uh, his sort of lack of ability in the field of mechanical engineering. The house famously leaks. The heating system famously doesn't. In other words, there's this kind of Vesuvius of bad facts and vitriol that's spewed up in the middle of the trial. There's, there's of course, lascivious suggestions that they were having an affair, so she was hoping to sort of get the house for free. Um, there is coverage in the newspapers, and ultimately, it's the coverage in the newspapers that forces Mies to basically back away. Mies's character is of some interest to me. It's a very closed character. I, I, you could say in a cliched manner, it's very German, but he hated the exposure that the trial bought, brought. He was actually quite ignorant about a lot of things, uh, the way things happened in America. And the way things happen in America, as most of us here know, is that if you go to trial, it's a public proceeding. So in any case, he eventually backed off. He hated the negative publicity. He hated his personal life uh, being written about in the papers. And so they ultimately settled for a risibly uh, small fee. But it was a very ugly ending to what had actually started as a, as a very promising relationship, um, you know, full of, of goodwill and intimacy. Okay, great, thank you. And I did wanna turn back to architecture here then um, and get back to this idea that the buildings can, buildings or places can sort of become pivotal characters in our lives. And I think that we do see in your book that um, there's this potential that places have to define individuals. So I wanted to ask, is that something that happens here? Um, we see that the house certainly changed the course of the lives of you know, the central figures that you've been telling us about. Um, but there's also this interesting sense that the house has become a museum, right? So it's, it's outlived or kind of superseded those same individuals. So it's even more at the foreground of the story in some ways. And, you know, the, the front of your book is, is a picture of the house. It's not a picture of uh, Edith or Mies. Um, but I, I do see that you, you sort of take the approach that the people are also central to the house. So it kind of goes both ways. And I wanted to ask you if that was... Um, if that was one of the goals of the book, was it to correct the sense that we are only approaching the house without the individuals and sort of flip that and reapproach it through the individuals? Or just what it, sort of the philosophical sense, I guess, um, of how, how you look at this house in the space? Right. Well, I mean, certainly the, 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 I have to ground my, any answer I have with the fact that the, the client was very dissatisfied with the house. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a professor of architecture. I know, I know enough to write a book, shall we say. But, um, you know, this is, um, this is a second home. Um, it's, it obviously has very few of what you might call the, you know, there's, there's basically no closet. Um, Edith had to really lobby to get a second bathroom. Uh, it's, a, it's an intellectual idea of a villa or of a second home in it. And, Mies was very interested in the concept of a villa, and here architecture is sort of eloquent, uh, going back to Roman times about what a, a home outside the city should be. 
but Edith was, a, a, I mean, a truly dissatisfied client. I mean, and, and as an aside, I mean, the Miesians, who are very, very influential in Chicago, um, Mises' uh, grandson is a, a very accomplished and practicing architect who, in fact, has actually redecorated the Farnsworth House now. It's owned by the National Trust. Um, and so the whole idea was to sort of kick out Edith Farnsworth's uh, furnishings and reinstall the, the sort of Barcelona style furnishings that Mies had intended. But in, in, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a, a little bit off the track, but the Miesians hate the fact that Eve's even called the Farnsworth house. And of course, uh, Edith Farnsworth hasn't lived in that house or had anything to do with that house for 50 years. So it, it has outlived her, but I, I do, you know, I can't go further until I note that, that she was a very dissatisfied occupant of the house. It was too hot in the summer. It didn't, didn't heat right in the winter. Plus she was really angry at Mies for any number of reasons. She, she probably felt jilted, um, you know, a, 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 a phrase you can't use anymore. Um, so she, she proved to be the, the imperfect occupant um, of the house and uh, was very happy to sell it, oddly, to probably the absolute perfect occupant of the house, a man who's still living, a, a very wealthy, uh, I, I think I describe him as a London playboy, although I'm hoping not to be sued. But um, <laughs> in any case, Lord Peter Palumbo is easily uh, Googleable. He's a patron of, of the architectural arts, among other things. And I, I don't want to belabor this, but he probably was the perfect owner of the house. He, in fact, had collected other, uh, a famous Corbusier, a famous Wright. And when he lived in, he never lived in this house because he considered it unlivable, as did he the Farnsworth. He actually bought a kind of stately mansion in Plano, Illinois, and sort of used this as a tent platform. And if you look at it, you can kind of envision it as a tent platform. And he used to, you know, his children sort of used to sort of camp out there. And at one point, uh, Mies, had, had foreseen the possibility that the Fox River would flood. Um, again, it's very close to the river and those columns or pilings, whatever, you, you know, Mies, it's, four, it's five feet, four inches above the ground. And Palumbo thought it was all a lark. And literally once, you know, he used to sometimes serve guests out of his canoe when the, when the, the Fox River would actually overflood the entire sort of meadow in which the house sits. So he was a great, a great kind of, owner, hell fellow well met, didn't have to live there, had the means to not live there. And now, now the house is, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It is, it is quite literally a museum. It's a bit of a white elephant for the National Trust. I wish everyone here would take the time to visit the Farnsworth house. It's actually hard to get there. I'm obsessed with the fact that Illinois has built so many super highways that it's actually harder to get to now than it was for Dr. Edith Farnsworth at the time. But anyway, Ask me another question. <laughs> we'll move on to the next question. Um, I did still want to talk about how the, so the house isn't just a, any building, you know, it's a piece of domestic architecture where you really do have to live inside of it, or at least as your second home, you have to occupy it overnight. Well, let me interrupt you because yes. I mean, in a sense, I failed to mention, and I know everybody here is smart and can see, I mean, I failed to mention the, the, the key point, which is it's a glass house, okay? <laughs> It's a glass house for an, and I, I, you know, please have the sexism trial later in, in absentia. It's a glass house for an attractive woman in her 40s. Um, those curtains that you see there were actually not planned by Mies. It's a huge bogus controversy. Mies uh, did in fact have um, uh, lines installed that so the curtains could be put in, but it, she had to demand curtains. So that's the kind of primal level on which Mies wanted to create and famously said, you know, I want to let the outdoors in. This is the perfect picture in front of you to show what Mies wanted to do. He saw the house as a window to this startling nature that is surrounding. It's a nine acre plot, although she later bought, in other words, there's nothing, no one can see in the house, but the way she and Mies perceived the house was radically different. You know, she sees herself as a person, forget that she's a woman, she's just a person living her life, getting up in the morning, and you know, the house is completely transparent. It did have um, consequences. Mies promoted this house all over the world, and architecture students 
basically trespassed on her property and she would find herself, let's, I don't know, these words are from a, a different era, but let's say she got out of bed and was in a peignoir and blinking architecture students were there. <laughs> so the thing that Mies, in a way, is, I would, you know, I would argue maybe is at the core of what he wanted to do with this house, create um, uh, a membrane, you know, it's a constructed membrane. Some of this is in the book and you'll have to sort of get there. It's a crazy Bauhaus German idea from the twenties. As you can see, I mean, again, he's creating sort of, the house is a window onto this extraordinary piece of nature and Farnsworth, whom I didn't even mention, was a published poet and a very talented writer. I mean, she wrote about what it feels like to occupy someone else's idea of transparency. And from her perspective, it didn't feel good. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that we've got this image back up here and that you've, you know, explained that, that this is indeed a glass house and people could sort of peek in and see her see her trying to live her life and she didn't have a great deal of privacy and her neighbors was out, could always tell when she arrived by flipping the lights on, things like this. Um, it, it gets at the, the core of my next question, um, which is basically that as you've walked us through, I think Mies had this idea of how to solve the problem of kind of a shelter, giving someone a house that is at one with nature or that is in harmony with nature. And you also introduce us to other characters, in particular Frank Lloyd Wright, who were grappling with the same issue. Um, but at the, you know, I feel that maybe the central conflict between the two characters is just also the conflict between just a, an architect who has a great theoretical idea and someone who has to live with that idea and the practicalities of what it means to live inside of a work of art. Um, so I guess, you know, my question is, was that, was that the conflict that you also perceived between the two characters? More so um, than about, you know, we get into the, the money difficulties and the, the fact that Mies, you know, I don't know how many times as much, um, what did this cost, like four times as much as it was meant to in the end? Um, yeah, obviously, that's, four, what, sure. that's what um, the trial was about. But I think that there was a very emotional appeal um, that we, we sort of start to start to feel for Edith, who's trying to vacation in this house when it's not at all really relaxing for her. Right. I mean, the, 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 the circumstances weren't particularly kind to Edith. And it, I'm not the person who uh, came up with this formulation. But originally, when she was uh, discussing the house with Mies, she really wasn't discussing the house as a, as a client. And she made very few suggestions. Um, a, a, a professor, uh, Alice Friedman, deserves credit for coming up with this idea that she was really more of a patron. And she, she sort of uh, underwrote, because she believed so deeply in Mies, in his genius, and she was in love with him. So she allowed him to create his ideal house. And in the book and in the, the record, she actually thought she might share ownership of the house with Mies. And a lot of the, the, the young associates working in Mies's office felt they were building Mies's dream house. I mean, which of course proved to be ironically true. So um, what you don't have in this relationship and what you don't have in this book is um, what, there's probably people watching this, including myself, who I like, let's say, you know, I commissioned an addition. So you might know what it's like to work with an architect. And normally the architect says, what would you like? You know, how, how do you want this to be? That, that never happened <laughs> with me, Sunita. It hardly ever happened in the sense, yes, he added a bathroom. Um, you know, yes, he added a place for her to put her stereo. But the core idea was never challenged by Edith. She never said, wow, a glass house. I wonder what that's going to be like to live in. <laughs> um, and that created, uh, again, terrible problems when their, their relationship was no longer one of sharing. Right. So it seems that there was some sort of misconception between, you know, Edith give, maybe giving the impression that Mies could design something experimental 
without remembering that she was in fact a human being who would have certain needs when seeking shelter, basically. Right. I mean, um, it's interesting. I, I don't, uh, if there's a fascinating uh, online exhibit right now, if you go to the Farnsworth House website, which is curiously, it's featuring all of the furnishings that Edith put in the house, all of which Mies hated and was very vocal about hating. And the, the, the National Trust has redecorated the house with all of Edith's stuff in it. And they've thrown out all the, all the Barcelona Mies stuff. And what's interesting is it reveals, this is also in my book, but um, when I call her a patron of the arts, uh, she was quite literally, a, you know, she was a collector. Um, a lot of her sculptures now at the Chicago Institute of Art. So it's very much in keeping with her character that she would have commissioned this house um, as as a work of art, and and then you know would have been willing to live with the negative consequences. Let me. I'm going to give a super brief uh, architectural riff. I should say for for people interested and more knowledgeable than I about architecture, it this isn't. Uh, really just a model of a house. Um, in my book and, and elsewhere in many architectural histories it's explained that, that this is the template of all things for um, the famous high rises that Mies was building more or less simultaneously at this time in Chicago known as 860, 880 Lakeshore Drive. I'm not gonna climb down here in the proverbial weeds but um, he used the exact same template of the Farnsworth house to create the apartments at Lakeshore Drive, one of which I got to live in, which were, um, which I think, again, it's a matter of taste, I've incredibly dramatic, but the inhabitants of these apartments on Lakeshore Drive also live with floor to ceiling glass walls. Now, they were allowed to have uh, curtains of a certain kind, et cetera, et cetera. But it may, I mean, they were, you know, as you can imagine, uh, weather comes off Lake Michigan. I mean, you could be on the 23rd floor of that building and essentially you're in the Farnsworth house and there's a thunderstorm happening all around you. So um, it, this wasn't some toy of Mises creation. Um, it was something that, that became uh, a very pretentious ar architecture term. It became a part of his vernacular um, and it went into, I mean, basically, I don't know, there's probably seven or eight uh, major Miesian works. It's a, that's a flip comment, but certainly the apartment buildings at Lakeshore Drive are among uh, Mises' greatest works, and they spring directly uh, from the Farnsworth house. Yeah, and I do recommend if, if uh, everybody's not familiar with Mies van der Rohe's other buildings and other works of art, I definitely recommend Googling those after this talk. I, I, find my, I found myself in quite a rabbit hole, go, and I lived in Chicago for many years, but hadn't had the chance to appreciate these buildings, actually. And I was, you know, my interest was, uh, was piqued, I have to say, and it's, it's fascinating to compare those to the Farnsworth House, as you're, as you're pointing out. Um, I wanted to return to the idea of this tension between you know, Edith wanting to furnish her own house and Mies having very specific ideas about the furniture that he designed that would be inside that house with her. Um, and this comes up several times in the book, not only with, uh, with Mies, but also with Frank Lloyd Wright, who I think was the one who, who had this idea that he could even clothe the people that were living in his houses, or they had some sort of idealized clothing that they would be wearing while they were living in his house. I just found that fascinating, sort of the the amount of control that the architect wanted to have um, in some way over what what goes on in the house. Um, so we, we see this tension really clearly with Edith and Meese because they they had a relationship that preceded the house that you know went on while she was living there and maybe sort of <laughs> fell off at the end of it. But um, yeah, I, it was that a discovery for you as well? The the tension between the architect wanting to you know kind of micromanage every aspect of the lifestyle. Of would the you, residence? Catherine, would you pull up that picture? We have a picture of yeah. Edith on a on a Barcelona lounger of all things. I think it shows us a tiny bit of the interior. Um, I think you know the one I mean. Uh, yes. Here she is. <laughs> That's a famous picture, right? Um, and it's not a Barcelona lounger. I stand corrected. This just for the the sake of the back and forth. This is. Um, if you go to the Farnsworth House website right now, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I cannot actually, all of this is, um, 
is contemporary, meaning 1950s uh, modernist furniture. I believe it's Scandinavian. And I, I, I perhaps should know uh, what it is, and I, but I can't identify it. You can see the, the, the kind of crazy uh, Calder-like light. Um, I've, I've since, I, I, I'm certain that the woman flopped on the daybed here is, is Dr. Farnsworth, but it's, that's, even that's been challenged. You can see the potted plants. Mies hated the potted plants. He hated the loungers. He hated everything that she did. You can see her poodle, by the way. I don't think Mies hated her poodle, but that's her famous poodle on the right, right hand margin, Amy looking in. It's a crazy picture. I don't even, this picture's in the Newbury Library among her, uh, among her effects. Um, this whole thing, I mean, right, I mean, again, I know there are people with us here who visited, who have visited Frank Lloyd Wright homes. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright's furniture design, you briefly alluded to the fact that, in fact, at one, at one time he actually designed dresses for the women whom he wanted to, which is, of course, nuts. And Wright, Wright is delightfully nuts. But um, Wright's, Wright's furniture is, uh, uns I mean, again, in my view, unspeakably interesting and creative and fascinating. Um, th and so it, it's weird that I'm trying to illustrate uh, this topic with a negative, but this is not Mises furniture. This is not the furniture he wanted in there. But, you know, Edith had her own taste. She had her own way that, that she wanted to live. Um, this came up uh, briefly. I mean, it's funny that I mentioned there are seven Mies masterpieces. Again, um, for those of you who live in Europe, um, Mises' greatest, other greatest residence, and I think I said this is his greatest residence in America, at least I hope I said that, because basically, forgetting the McCormick House, it's his only residence in America. But um, the Tugendhat House in Brno, Czechoslovakia, is a very, very famous and important Mies residence. And that was, and I'm, since I didn't write a book about it, I'm not going to get get lost in it. But that was a very different situation where his clients were a wealthy Czech couple, they had children, and that was a much more typical uh, client architect relationship where uh, both the husband and wife uh, were smart and forceful. And, the, and you know, this whole idea of the open plan, again, I'm, just out of, I'm going to conjure up the Barcelona Pavilion, which we don't have a picture of, probably Mises' greatest uh, masterpiece, certainly in my view. Mises uh, believes in the so-called open plan, you know, minimal use of walls, screens instead of walls. The Tugendhat said, forget it, we're not going to live in an open plan house. We, we want a bedroom, we want to close the door to our bedroom, our kids want bedrooms. So that's a much more typical uh, back and forth. Uh, the Tugendhat house, I, I mean, I, I I certainly haven't seen it. Perhaps some people have seen it. In any case, in the Farnsworth house, Mies sort of got to do exactly what he wanted. And so it's in, in a way, it's like what the Tugendhat family would have been living in if, um, if they hadn't pushed back and said, you know, families have a certain way of living and this ain't it. In other words, living in one big glass room is not how a family lives. So anyway, that's a di digression. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I just remember the, the anecdote of, how Mies is uh, what his contractors would try to deliver the furniture sort of unsuspectingly just after the lunch hour when the clients would be in a good mood so that he got his way. <laughs> yes, yes. He tried to force, I mean, Tugendhat's wife conspired to get the modernist furniture into the house. She said, my, yeah, my husband will have had a brandy after lunch, but uh, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, the book is just full of wonderful moments like that. So I, if I haven't already recommended it heartily enough, I want to say to everybody that they should absolutely read this, this fantastic book. Um, Thank you. Thank you but we're, we're almost out of time here. So I think I'll just ask one more question. We've sort of been through this in the, in the sense that you've already mentioned the exhibition that's currently at the Farnsworth House. Um, the Edith Farnsworth's Country House is what it's, what it's called. Um, but I thought maybe we would connect the two points. Uh, we talked about the later owner, but not so much about how the house became a museum or what the experience might be like today visiting. Um, do you want to fill in those, fill in those dots for us? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I would urge anyone to to go see it. I, of course, I've been uh, several times. Um, it belongs to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, I, I mean. Speaking out of school, um, I had a friend on the board of the National Trust, and the Farnsworth House is a real white elephant um, because uh, it's hard it's hard to get to, as I previously mentioned. Half the year now, and partly because of climate change, 
um, it's it's on you know it's underwater. That's a crazy exaggeration, but uh, there's been a lot more flooding of late. I should say again, I'm sure some people with us here get that there's another glass house in America. Okay, we haven't talked about this, but uh, the glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut, built by Philip Johnson, uh, is built from the exact same plans as the Farnsworth House. Now, ironically. The National Trust also owns Philip Johnson's house in New Canaan, Connecticut, which is much easier to visit. It's very close to New York. Um, if you want to go see a glass house essentially designed by Mies van der Rohe, you can go to New Canaan, Connecticut. It might be easier for you to get to than Plano, Illinois. In any event, uh, Johnson, uh, a very interesting character. There's a chapter in my book about Johnson because he was a, a disciple of Mises. He, he borrowed, he didn't steal the glass house plans. Mies let, them ha let him have them, but he built his, his own glass house really in exactly the, using the same plans. And I, he was very, anyway, he was very, very wealthy. So the National Trust doesn't have as many headaches with the glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut, uh, because Johnson left an endowment and um, as it does with the glass house in Plano, Illinois where there, there is no endowment, um, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, now I'm hoping everyone here will visit both houses. They're certainly both worth visiting. That's a very diplomatic way to wrap up, isn't it? <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Alex. We've just hit the mark where we should transition to audience questions. Um, so please do submit those via the chat feature if you have any, and I'll read them aloud for Alex. Um, looks like we already have a few here, so I'll dive right in. Um, Okay, so the first question is about the French architect Robert Mallet Stevens and what, if any, his impact was in the world of Mies van der Rohe. Is that a relationship? I don't think you explore that in the book, but... I just, I have to be uh, welcome to my bath of ignorance. I really apologize. <laughs> I don't know the name. Uh, the name, I don't believe it came up while I was researching the book. And if I overlooked something, it wouldn't be out of character. That's totally fine. Okay. Uh, what was the date of construction of the house? Right. Um, uh, Mies, <laughs> for some reason, I mean, instead of just answering 1951, apparently I'm going to give a longer answer. <laughs> Mies and Edith met in, uh, as described in the book in 1945 at a dinner party. And she said, incredibly at the dinner party, she said, will you build me a house or have one of your smart young people build me a house? He said, sure, I'll build you a house. So that was in 1945 for various reasons, um, and somewhat involving ramping up for the Korean War. And Mies wanted to, he, he wanted to build this from prefab steel. They had trouble getting the prefab steel for various reasons. They didn't, and, uh, they didn't start uh, paying for and building the house until late 1949, which actually, uh, even though I was late to explain this to you, which accounts for the fact that the Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut, was built and completed before the Farnsworth House. The Farnsworth House was completed in 1951. Johnson had built his house in 1947 and told Mies, this thing's gonna cost $70,000, not the $40,000 that you've told your client it's gonna cost. Maybe you should inform her. And that was one element in the beginning of the kind of explosive breakup between architect and client in my book. Okay, the next question is, what was the source of the principal research for this book? Did you look at interviews as well? Yeah, um, this, I mean, this book was, was, was funner than heck um, to research. Uh, I, I, I actually had written another book basically out of Chicago. I had to go to Chicago. I mean, everything that you would want to write this book is, is in Chicago with a couple of exceptions. Um, uh, Edith Farns, I mean, you know, writers, writers have little secrets. And the, the secret is that, you know, before I really embarked on the book, I, I found out that Edith Farnsworth's papers were at the Newbury Library in Chicago and that they were open. Not, not all papers are open, as writers know, and it's always sad when that's not the case. But I'm also at the Newbury Library was an unpublished autobiography that, that she had written about her life. She started writing this autobiography very late in her life. Um, she had left for Florence. She actually bought an actual villa, not a Mies designed villa, but she bought an actual sort of Quattrocento villa outside of um, 
Florence, and she started writing the story of her life. Anyway, that was all at the Newberry, very easy to find. Um, I wish, I mean, of course, there are people alive who knew both Mies and Edith. I, I wish there had been more of them. Um, Mies's grandson's alive. He, he's not very interested in talking about the Farnsworth house. He doesn't like Edith Farnsworth. He never liked her, but he's very straight about that and very honest. Um, her only living, well, th th anyway, the only living relative of hers of any use to me was her, her very helpful nephew, who's alive. And then, I mean, and then the kids, oddly, she taught violin and French to uh, kids who lived in Plano, Illinois, and they're all uh, grown-ups now, and I, uh, I was able to find them. So I, I, I would have liked to have known more people who knew Edith Farnsworth directly. I'll just, you know, hand wave the idea of researching Mies, um, because it's just not that hard. His papers are at the Library of Congress and the Museum of Modern Art. And um, the friends of mine, although one of them is no longer living, I mean, the, the University of Chicago uh, updated biography of Mies published in 2012 is, a, is an utter masterpiece. And one of the co-authors helped me a great deal. And in fact, gave me the, the trial transcript, um, which he had unearthed. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. The next audience question is um, an observation that the house is very minimalist. And uh, so does it reflect the Bauhaus's early links with Zen? With? Zen, so Zen Buddhism. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the Bauhaus. Um, and I don't know uh, about Mises' relationship uh, to Zen if any, I don't, I'm not dismissing the question by any means, um, in part because one of the best pieces of writing about this house was written by Dirk Lohan, uh, Mises grand, grandson, who is an architect, and it was written for a, a very abstruse Tokyo based architecture journal. And um, it is, I love to use the it is no accident, as the Marxists like to say, that this that the Farnsworth House is very highly regarded in Japan for the obvious reasons. I think that the questioner is getting to the bottom of um, it. You know, it 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 seems to me like an ideal place to have the tea ceremony, but I don't want to move further out on this limb before it breaks under the weight of my portentousness, <laughs> because I really, you know, yes, there's some Japaneseness to it. But uh, Mies is super interested in esoteric philosophy. It's just that I, I can't claim to know that he was interested in esoteric uh, Asian philosophy. Right. Okay, the next question is about uh, Mies again. So what did you learn about Mies in the research for this book that is not generally known? <laughs> mm -hmm. I could think of a thousand answers to that, but... <laughs> oh. What, what, oh, there's so many fun anecdotes with him. Or just, and then I'll, I'll have a long... No, involved. no, I, I, I shouldn't. But I really loved your portrayal of Mies and the quotes you chose and his, you know, his sort of treatises that you quoted from. The, it's just fantastic. He comes through I, very, very well. I mean, not in a good light all the time, but very strongly. I see. Yeah. Um, I mean, I liked, uh, I liked Mies. Um, not everyone does. I guess, and I and I, apol I, I you know, my whole life is an extended apology. So, I'll, I mean, I guess what's somewhat interesting about Mies it, that's in this book is that he's a, he's a true lover of women. Um, and I, I guess a separate book will probably never be written because I mean, one of the people I could not access really was. Um, was Laura Marx. Now, anyone who knows anything about Mies knows that in Germany, his companion, Lily Reich, was uh, his collaborator. Um, I mean, he really, his coexister. But interestingly, Mies, Mies never, I mean, and I don't mean this in a strange way, Mies never lived without a woman, and he never lived without an incredibly intelligent, forceful, and artistically inclined woman. And that actually is borne out in my book, interestingly. And Edith Farnsworth was one of them. But where Mies was, I mean, Mies was, was into sort of a, a serial uh, collaborator and cohabitor with some of the most fascinating women 
of the 20th century. Now, you, you won't get that in your architecture journals, I'll <laughs> wager. And maybe less about the drinking as well, which you, you do explore. <laughs> he, he drank excessively. He drank like five martinis at lunch. It's just unimaginable. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll take one last question here. Um, so at first an observation, both Mies and Wright built houses which look great but have issues with construction and usability, leaky roofs, poor heating, etc. Is this a lack of interest, lack of skills, or are there other reasons behind it? Right, that's, that's a that's an important question. There's a lot of detail in my book, and as I hinted uh, in the lawsuit about certain elements of this house that don't function. I'm not, I didn't write a book on Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, although I probably should have, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, um, Mies, Mies was not, a, I mean, it's important to note before we go off on the fact that the, the mass stick on the edge of the roof wasn't properly set. Uh, and I, I don't to, I'm not trying to trespass in your time. Mies was the son of a, of a gilded, G-U-I-L-D-E-D, -E stonemason from Aachen, Germany. Mies never got an architecture degree. Mies was all about materials, as Wright was. So before I get off on this tangent about the roof leaking, you know, et cetera, you know, the, the electricity not being enough amperes or something. Um, I mean, and I, Mies, Mies knew brick, he knew steel, and he knew glass, uh, probably better than any, well, you know, at the highest possible level. So but again, before one finds fault with his mechanical, electrical, engineering, and um, et cetera, et cetera, it's important that, for instance, uh, glass had never been installed in a house at this size. Um, he knew that it could be done uh, uh, technically, and he commissioned it. Girders were never used like this in a house before he did it. So I, I, I want to go out on a high note where my friend Mies is concerned. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, there were problems, but I mean, this is this is one of the great uh, creative appliers of of materials and appreciator of materials. Certainly, in the same way that Wright was that incredible sense when you walk inside a a Frank Lloyd Wright house and you put your hand on that wood and you go, oh my God. So um, yes, yes problems, but, but the, the kind of the, the brilliance of the creation, I would argue, overawes the, the problems associated with this particular house. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, I'm noting that Deborah here is, is coming to our rescue with some architectural facts in the comments, if anybody wants to explore that. We're sort of out of time, but maybe just to share this one comment from Deborah, who says, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright retorted that they shouldn't have left his work of art out in the rain if the owner didn't want it to leak. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Wright made a, made a, that's his famous cynical comment to Philip Johnson, whom he came to despise. He said, oh, Philip, I see you've come to build little buildings out in the rain. And it was a, a reference to the leaks in Philip Johnson's glass house in Connecticut. I mean, right, I, 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 when I, I pitched this book to an editor friend of mine and he said, you know, Alex, if you don't write a book about Frank Lloyd Wright, no one's gonna buy it. I have to say <laughs> there's so many great books about Frank Lloyd Wright. So I would certainly recommend them to everyone watching as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for the conversation, Alex. This has been fantastic. And, thank you, uh, Catherine. Thank everyone who attended. Yes, Deeply thank you to, to all of our attendees also for your attention and your questions. This has been really fantastic. Um, I did want to mention that, you know, before I let everybody go here, that we do have one final event um, next Wednesday. If anybody might be interested, we'll be hosting Dr. Robert Murphy, who will speak to us about um, COVID, actually. So he's on the front lines working with Northwestern um, to, to fight COVID and to work on finding a vaccine. And we'll be able to ask him our questions. He's a member of the library, so it should be a really nice, intimate event. Um, and finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, the American Library is a nonprofit. And normally in our in-person events, there's an opportunity to donate as you walk in. We invite donations of 10 euros. And if you're still interested in supporting the library, I do invite you to follow the link that went out with the email um, to provide the Zoom meeting details. Uh, you can feel free to click through and explore ways to support the library. And 
thank you all for attending. Thank you for being here. And thank you once again to Alex Bean. Bye bye and thank you. Bye. Well done, Alex. Take care, Ned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was